Her research funded by NICHD, NIDCD, and Autism Speaks focuses primarily on the interface between the development of early motor skills and the emergence of communication and language in typical development and in children with or at risk for developmental disorders. Dr. Iverson has published a co-edited book and more than 90 articles and book chapters. She's on the editorial boards of the journal of Child Language, Language Learning and Development in Infancy. Since 1991, she has served as an, as an international investigator at the CNR in Rome, Italy. Get invited to that. <laughs> Dr. Iverson was awarded the University of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh's Chancellor's Distinguished Research Award in 2007 and the Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award in 2018. And I think many of us in this audience probably know her for having pioneered the work in studying the relationship of language and atypical development in infants at risk for autism and risk for developmental disorders. I'll say I was incredibly inspired when I started looking through you know, her, pa her papers and the work that she'd done. And really, Dr. Iverson's work extends way beyond most of the literature that we're reading today with some of the earliest descriptions of how early motor development is really related to communication, babbling, um, onset of nonverbal and verbal communication, and having done work with some other giants in the field, such as Esther Thelen. So I am very um, excited to introduce Dr. Iverson today, and thank you so much for being here. So thank you. Can everybody hear me, first of all? Yeah, OK, great. Um, thank you, Rajuta, for that extremely nice introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I have to say that I feel a little bit like a starry-eyed fan in the presence of rock stars, because there are so many people in this room whose work I've followed for a really long time and really respect. So it is really an honor to be here. Um, so what I to tell you a bit about um, the work that my students and I have been doing looking at um, infants who are at risk for developing autism spectrum disorder because they have an older sibling who already has a diagnosis of ASD. And this work has been kind of a happy accident, to be honest. Um, I am, was not trained as an autism scientist. Um, and in fact, I worked primarily on infants um, who were neurotypically developing for a very long time in the early part of my career um, until one day I was a very stressed assistant professor sitting in my office trying to figure out how in the world I was ever going to get tenure and one of my graduate students who was older than I was came to my office and said you know there's a group of autism researchers over at the medical school I was at the University of Missouri at the time um, and they would like to write I think this might have been like before the CPEA grants um, were, were submitted they would like to write a uh, um, a center grant and they need someone who studies language and communication to be part of it and I looked at her and I said you know what I, I'm sorry I just can't I'm an assistant professor I can't do another thing right now and since my student Barbara Braddock was older than I was she gave me her best mom look and mom voice and said it's just one meeting you can make an hour in your day to go to just one meeting and of course because I'm high in guilt I said <laughs> okay I'll go <laughs> so I went to this meeting I didn't know anything about autism at the time and I was immediately fascinated. I was, I was fascinated by the descriptions of children and their behavior that I heard. I was, um, I was captivated by the descriptions of their families and what strong advocates they were for their children. And so I was hooked. And so I agreed to be part of the group. Um, this was led by Judy Miles. Um, and the, the short end of the story is that the grant was not funded. Um, I had written a project that was basically a baby sibling study. It got very positive feedback, but I put it away and thought, you know, well, okay, I'm sad, but I have other things to do right now. Um, and then one day I was sitting at my kitchen table drinking my coffee and, you know, surfing the internet, and I got a phone call, um, and I answered the phone, and it was this voice that I had never heard before, and he said, um, I'm a, a program officer with NAR, the National Alliance for Autism Research. I understand that you want to do a baby sibling study, and we'd like to fund that work. So of course, we all know that that never happens, right? And so at that point, my career took a very sharp right-hand turn, and I began um, on this pathway that has, that has generated a line of work that we've now been engaged in for about 15 years. Um, and so with that, about the basic problem that we're
which many of you in this room are familiar with, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But as you know, early diagnosis of autism is a complex problem. Um, many of the behaviors that are diagnostic in the DSM are, are ones that don't emerge in typical development until between the ages of about two and three years. So things like language, um, well, formerly language, um, social behaviors, so peer relationships, things like that, those are not things that infants have. And so therefore, clinicians have to wait until kind of past a time when when those behaviors would be typically expected to emerge in order to consider an ASD diagnosis. How and unfortunately, many parents go to their pediatrician with concerns about their child's development much, much earlier, sometimes as early as their as 12 month well baby visit. Um, and so there's this, this gap, there has been this gap between the time when parents report their first concerns and the age when a reliable diagnosis is actually possible. And so um, the goal that was articulated, I guess, probably about 15 or so years ago, perhaps even before that, was to try to identify early behavioral markers of risk for a future ASD diagnosis so that we could um, identify those children who seem to be kind of most likely to be on a trajectory towards an ASD diagnosis and, and intervene as early as possible. So as you know, this is a difficult thing to do in the general population because even though we hear a lot about ASD, it is a fairly low base rate disorder. So um, some of the most recent statistics have talked about prevalence of 1 in 40 children with ASD in the general population. So if we enrolled infants in the general population, and followed them until the age when an ASD diagnosis is possible, we would end up with about two, right, out of 100 infants who received an ASD diagnosis. And that's a lot of work for a very small number of children. And so what many of us have begun to do is to study infants who have a sibling with an ASD diagnosis because we know that they're at heightened risk for ASD. There's an 18.7% recurrence rate. And so if we were to follow 100 baby siblings um, in their sib with ASD, we would end up with about 18 19 who receive an ASD diagnosis at the age of three or whatever our final time point might be. And so we've leveraged this um, and have done prospective studies that have followed children from as early in development as possible until the age when a reliable diagnostic classification is possible. So we can identify children at um, having, having ASD, having other developmental concerns, or being neurotypical. So we follow them in time, and then we can go back and look at, in infancy, whether there are patterns of development or other things that differentiate babies who go on to ASD or other developmental concerns from babies who are neurotypical developing. Okay, so today what I'm going to tell you about is um, a set of findings from two different studies in which we followed two cohorts of infants. So we are now at the fourth cohort of baby siblings. Um, these are two completed studies where everyone has been seen for 36 month um, diagnostic assessments. So the first cohort was our kind of initial um, dipping of our toes into the water of baby sibling studies. This was the work that was funded by NAR. Um, so in this study we followed 21 high risk infants, um, three of whom were subsequently diagnosed with, uh, this was autistic disorder back then. Um, and we had a comparison group. 18 low-risk infants. Um, these were infants who were later-born siblings of neurotypically developing children, and they also had no immediate family history of ASD. The second cohort um, consisted exclusively of high-risk infants, so we enrolled 80 high-risk infants who completed the study. Um, and then this is the breakdown of the 36-month classification. So 11 went on to an ASD diagnosis. That's about a 15% recurrence rate. 22 were identified at age 3 as having not ASD, but a clinically significant language delay. So the language was well behind what we would expect on the basis of their age. And this group has recently turned out, turned out to be quite important for us as a contrast group. So we've been able to look at whether there are 
babies who went on to ASD that differ from those of the babies with language delay, right, to ask whether, um, whether our findings are specific to ASD or whether they might just be a manifestation of more general developmental delays. And then 39 had no ASD diagnosis or language concerns, so they were neurotypically developing. Um, so our general procedure, and I'm happy to talk about this in more detail later on. So we visit families in their homes. All of our data collection takes place in families' homes. We visit them monthly, so depending on the study protocol, um, of the visits might vary slightly, but for these two that I'm going to tell you about, we began um, visiting families and babies at five months, saw them monthly until 14 months, and then followed up at 18, 24, and 36 months. The was generally divided into two segments. Um, so there was a portion that we call naturalistic, which was basically we walk in, tell the parent, just go ahead and continue whatever you were doing before we showed up with our video cameras and small army of people to watch you and your child. And actually parents are quite good at um, that we're there. So this was designed to be just kind of what do babies do typically at the and then we had a portion of the session which involved semi-structured play. So we had parents um, and infants play with some of their own toys, own favorite toys, and then we also provided toy sets as well. Um, at interval, so beginning at six months, we administered standardized developmental assessments, so the Mullen scales of early learning, for example. Um, and then at 36 months, everyone came to the University of Pittsburgh campus and the um, ADOS was administered along with standardized assessments. And then the final classification decision was made by an experienced clinician who was naive to all previous study data. Okay, so um, I two things that I have remaining so and of course I forgot to set, turn on my little timer so I'll just watch the clock in the back no. okay okay that'd be great um, so first of all I want to talk about some of our newer findings um, that have to do with aspects of motor development and early identification of ASD and so I'm going to tell you about some new data that we have on the development of standing and walking and kind of step back and take a broader approach and think about how these early differences that I'm going to show you might ca have cascading effects on infants' language development. Okay, so standing and walking. So just by way of background, because all of you probably don't love standing as much as I do, um, most babies begin to stand from an adult at fairly early ages, sometimes as early as four and five months, and we all probably know a baby or two who loves to be standing, right, and does not like to sit down. So this is something that happens fairly early, and what's important here is that babies can be passive. So they have the adult who's providing support, helping them kind of maintain the upright posture in the face of gravitational forces that are counteracting that. Sometime between eight and ten, babies start to start start to sustain their own standing posture so this is important they're using this baby here is using her hands on that table to hold herself up so this is a major advance because it, now this baby has to has to work herself right maintaining the upright position in the face of the challenge of gravity right um, so this is a, a significant step forward and then finally at around 11 months or so babies start to stand on their own and that is, of course, um, a prelude to that exciting first moment for every parent, the onset of walking. Whoops, wait, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you some longitudinal data um, that looked at standing. So why standing, first of all? Well, there's a lot of evidence of and postural control in both children and adults with an ASD diagnosis. So we were interested in asking whether we might see some of, some of these kind of similar challenges in infants who went on to an ASD diagnosis. So this is part of a dissertation done by, by my former student Nina Liesenbaum. So she took data from our sessions at 6, 8, 10, 12, and 14 months. Um, and we coded video from um, these sessions. We selected a 30-minute segment that was from partly from the naturalistic portion, partly from parent-child play. The only constraint was that infants had to be free to move during this time. So we could not, we didn't use segments where babies were being held or where they were in like infant furniture, for example. 
Um, she coded a broad range of postures, but here we're just gonna, I'm just gonna talk about um, standing. So we distinguish between supported standing, um, so either sustained by the infant, so the infant is holding him or herself up with the hands and arms, or sustained by either an adult um, or kind of leaning up against a piece of furniture. I'm just gonna focus on infant sustained supported standing for today. Um, and then also, of course, unsupported standing. So the infant is standing, the hands are free to move, not touching anyone else and not being held up by anyone. So the dependent measure I'm gonna talk about is um, the duration of these postures. So the percent of the observation time that babies spent in standing postures. So um, just to orient you to the, to the figures, because there's gonna be a series of them Similar. These are um, fitted curves from hierarchical linear models. Um, and again, the dependent variable here is the percentage of time that infants spent in supported standing out of the 30 minute observation. <laughs> so on the x axis are, are five different time points so 6, 8, 10, and 12, uh, 12 and 14 months. Um, and then the blue line um, represents the curve for the low risk infants. The orange, the high risk no diagnosis group. The yellow, the high risk language delay group. And I'm sorry, the gray, the high risk language delay group. And the yellow, the high risk ASD group. So a couple of things to point out here. Um, so one is that obviously at six months, no one is really doing very much standing, not surprising. But then we see in the low risk infants, this relatively acceleration and a decelerating pattern that begins right around 12 months, right? As infants begin to transition away from supported standing and more to unsupported standing walking. Um, the high risk no diagnosis and high risk group show a similar kind of pattern, growth pattern, to somewhat attenuated. What's striking is that the high risk ASD group does not show that acceleration, right? So they show only linear growth. And so what that means is that they start off slower and they remain slow over time, right? So they're consistently spending less time in supported standing up through 14 months. And so the difference between um, the high risk ASD group and the low risk group is becomes significant at eight months and then it's maintained throughout the rest of the observation period. Okay, so that's supported standing in general. So what about infant sustained supported standing, right? So I talked about kind of an important transition where infants have to begin to manage their own postural control, right? So they're trying to maintain their balance in the face of gravity that's pulling them down. They have big heads. It's hard to keep your center of mass up, right, when you're in a standing position. So there's a whole set of new challenges that they have to address. And they begin to do that when they start holding themselves upright. So this is a figure, again, the fitted curves um, for these data. The graph is organized in exactly the same way as the previous one. And so here, the difference between the low risk and the high risk no diagnosis and high risk language delay groups compared to the high risk ASD group is even more striking. So again, you see this sort of accelerating pattern where infants are spending progressively more time in infant sustained supported sitting right up through 12 months and we see the beginning of kind of a plateau between 12 and 14 months. The high risk ASD group shows this kind of accelerating pattern over time, right? So they, they grow more slowly early on, but then the, there's a, the, then the growth kind of accelerates between 12 and 14 months. So the result is that by 14 months, they've caught up. They're spending just as much time sustaining their own, themselves in the standing posture compared to the other three contrast groups, right? And so at eight months, the difference is significant. At 10 months, at 12 months, but by 14 months, it's no longer significant. Okay, and then finally, for unsupported standing, um, so not surprisingly, it takes a while for this to get going, right? Really nobody is engaging in unsupported standing much before 10 months, and even those little guys are a little ahead of schedule. Um, so we, we see here this sort of fan effect, so this kind of rapid acceleration for the low risk and high risk no diagnosis groups some extent for the high risk language delay group, but then a significantly lower acceleration um, for the high risk ASD group with the net result that at 14 months, they're spending significantly less time in unsupported standing compared to the other three groups of infants. Okay, so 
and mean when we start to think about the transition to walking. So um, one thing that, that we have started to do is in addition to looking at um, data in relation to infant age, we've also started to look at it in relation to milestone attainment. So we've started to look at um, once infants have attained a milestone, milestone as kind of a rough proxy for experience. So now that you've started walking, regardless of the age at which you start walking, what does development look like with um, accumulating months of walking experience? And so this is um, brand new work from Kelsey West. This is her couple of months. So what she did was take a milestone based approach to looking at walking walk onset for all of our infants and that was the session where they could first take about three steps independently without holding on to anyone with hands free um, and not holding on to anything and then she went backwards three months backwards three months so for a total of seven time points so that was and I'll show you data on the timing of walk onset in a moment the idea here was to look at now that infants have begun to walk and now that they're starting to accumulate experience with walking what are they doing with walking how are they using it in order to interact with their environments and so what she did was um, code 10 minutes of our sessions again infants had to be free to move this was during the parent-child play primarily she identified all bouts of locomotion. So I'm not going to talk about the crawling data. I'll just talk about the walking bouts. Um, and then the dependent measures that I'm going to tell you about are the total duration of walking in the 10 minutes. So how much time did infants actually spend walking? And then how often did they walk? So what was the frequency of their walking bouts? OK, so first of all, um, th these are the mean ages and the ranges for the onset of independent walking. So as you can see, our low risk group is about perfectly in line with the 12 month um, mark, which is more or less the average that's reported in the literature. Um, and then the only significant difference, um, surprisingly, was between the low risk and the high risk language delay group. But what you can see for all three of the high risk groups is that the range is expanded, right? So the tail is much longer. Um, and we have infants who are starting to walk at 16 and 17 months. That's well within the normal normative range, but it is definitely on the later side. So given this, everything that I'm going to show you um, and the analyses that I'm going to show you have all controlled for age at walk onset. OK, so um, with regard to the total duration of walking, so how much time did infants actually spend walking? So just to be clear here about the x-axis, so this is time relative to walk onset. So this is three months before the onset of walking all the way through three months post walk onset. Um, and of course, I noticed that the colors for each of the groups are different, so I apologize for that. Didn't think about color coordinating. Here's what you see. Obviously, no one's walking before walk on. Um, and then once they start walking, the amount of time that they spend walking increases very substantially. And there are actually no differences between any of those groups. So it's a very sharp, positive change in time spent walking. What is different, though, is the frequency of walking bouts. So for the high-risk ASD infants, you see that they increase in frequency of walking bouts quite sharply and just like the other comparison groups um, with one and two months of walking experience. But then they flatten out at that with three months of walking experience. So that was quite striking to us. And so that also led us to ask the question of, OK, so if they're spending much time walking, in terms of total time, but the instances of walking differ. What does that mean for how long they're walking? So it turns out that the average length of walking bouts for the high-risk ASD infants are significantly higher, right? So they're spending, their bouts are longer. We don't know what this means yet, and this is something that we're trying to follow up on now using more detailed measures of gait. Um, but the idea is that they're walking less frequently. So these bouts are extended in time. They could be slower, right? And so this is something that we're trying to figure out. Or they could just be spending more time walking. And so this is kind of an open question um, that we're trying to address. OK, and then one other piece of data that I wanted to show you, because it's something that we're, we're trying to think about um, more deeply now, is when infants walk, 
So what, what Kelsey did was code the number, the, the number and the repertoire of objects that infants touched while they were walking. So we wanted a sense of, were they touching objects? So where were they going in terms of going places? Were they going to objects? Were they going to people? And then when they went to objects, were those objects different? Or were they always going to the same subset of objects? And so that's actually what we ended up finding. So these are the data on number of unique objects that were touched by infants during bouts of walking. Again, with time relative to walking experience. Um, and this is collapsed across crawling and walk. Uh, this is for crawling earlier on and then for walking um, at walk onset. And so what you see here is that there's this, um, there's growth, right, positive growth for the low risk, the high risk, no diagnosis, and the high risk language delay group. They're not different from one another. The high risk ASD group, though, does not show this same positive change, right? So while they're, uh, while they're walking, they're not using walking in the same way. So they're not using it to explore a, bro a broader variety of toys. They're going back and revisiting the same objects multiple times. So that's something to just kind of keep in the back of your mind. We'll come back to that a little bit later on when I start to talk about cascading effects on development. OK, so to summarize, um, so our, our data on the transition to, stand, to suggest the following. So first of all, relative to one or more of the comparison groups, the high-risk ASD infants showed different patterns of growth in standing over time, and that, that those different patterns of growth resulted in less time spent standing. So one possibility, and again, this is something that we're following up on now, is that it's, it takes more time for them to master the unique challenges that the standing posture poses for them. So when you stand, the center of mass is raised farther above the ground. That presents problems with, with control relative to gravity. And the locus of postural sway, so when you're crawling, it's the wrists and the knees. But then when you stand, you have to use your feet and ankles to control that kind of back and forth and side to side sway. So these might be things that present particular problems for babies who go on to ASD. However, once they started to walk, they don't differ in overall amount of time spent walking. They do initiate walking less frequently, and there also are some differences in how they're using walking to explore the environment. OK, so moving on then to part two. So I want to take a step back. Um, Think a bit about what this means, right? So these are interesting data. They're suggestive that there are some early developmental differences that distinguish babies who are um, on a pathway towards an ASD diagnosis from infants who are not. <laughs> but what does this mean kind of in the broader context? Are these, diff are these early differences meaningful in thinking about um, how later development unfolds? So one thing that I think um, those of us who are involved with baby siblings research have learned um, in the course of our work is that it's a really hard thing to do. One of the robust findings is the variability that we see in these infants, and especially in the infants who do not go on to an ASD diagnosis. So many of those infants who don't go on to ASD or in who don't even go on to a language delay um, present with very significant early delays. So we see delays very early in development, especially in the onset of sitting. And for some babies, those stick around, right? For others, they resolve. And I can think of several babies who we have seen at 18 months have had concerns about. And then we've gone back six months later at two, and it's like a different child, right? Suddenly a child who's talking like a two-year-old and doing, doing two-year-old things. Um, and so questions you know, kind of why, right? Why is there all of this variability? And what does this variability mean um, when we think about the development of later emerging? So what I'd like to do with the rest of my time is try to address this question of how those early developmental differences impact later skills and the development of later skills. And I want to tell you two developmental stories. The first do with how abilities in seeming actually related to one another. And here I want to tell you the story of walking experience and vocabulary development. 
And then the second story has to do with the language learning environment. And here I want to tell you the story of the relation between fine motor skills and caregiver labeling behaviors. OK, so abilities in seemingly unrelated domains. So one thing that is, I think, um, about this kind of this whole theme is that as a person who really began by studying language development for a very long time, people were quite eager to show that motor skills had absolutely nothing to do with advances in language. And indeed, people went far out of their ways to try to control for motor experience and basically say, because motor, motor skills were kind of were treated as a proxy for maturation. And no one wanted language development to be influenced by simple maturation. So these two fields kind of existed in isolation for a very long period of time. And then um, part of the genius of Esther Thielen, who was my postdoc mentor, was that she kind of got people to think about how nonsensical that was. And that you know there is one child who exists in one body, and that body has experiences in the world, and everything matters, and everything is connected. And so why shouldn't motor skills be important in some way for language learning? So one of the things, so people have recently become quite interested in how walking changes infants' experiences in the physical and social world. Um, and so, for example, the findings that have emerged from recent work um, have illustrated that infant social bids change in quality, but not quantity, following the onset of walking. And one thing that happens um, is that when infants begin to walk, they start to do more of what we call moving bids, where they are carrying an object, extending it out to it towards the caregiver, looking at them, right? So a beautiful moment of social initiation, um, and then traveling towards them. So just to give you an example. Okay, so he's a pretty new walker, right? You can see he's like, you know, just barely able to keep himself upright as he's moving forward. But he's really enthusiastic about this book. And file this away for a little bit later. As a result, he hears two instances of the word book, right? So he's holding up the book, he's traveling to mom, he's paying attention to the book, he's vocalizing, and mom says, oh, it's your book, you love books, right? So it's a wonderful moment for language development. So infants start to do many more of these moving bids once they begin to walk. And as you can imagine, they're very salient to caregivers, right? It's hard to ignore a baby who's traveling towards you at 100 miles an hour, <laughs> carrying a toy and vocalizing and smiling and looking at you, right? As opposed to a baby who's sitting on the floor, not moving, perhaps holding up the same object, right? But not, there, there's not that kind of same, there's not that same energy, there's not that same, look what I'm doing kind of quality about it. The second um, emerged in the last several years is that after infants begin to walk, there's a qualitative shift in the rate of language development. So this is work that was done by Eric Wally and Joe Campos, where they demonstrated that um, vocab infants' vocabularies grow much more rapidly following the onset of walking. So we were interested in this question, given what we knew about early motor development in our high-risk infants, and also what we know about their language development. Oops. We OK. So we replicated this work in our high-risk and low-risk, with our high-risk and low-risk samples. Um, and so what you see here, I'm going to show you data for um, words understood. So these are data from the MacArthur Bates Communicative Development Inventory, which um, caregivers of our infants completed every month, um, pretty much for the duration of the study. I'm going to show you the data just from words understood, but they're identical for words produced. So what you see here are, is, again, time anchored relative to walking experience in months. So here we have um, the pre-walking visits. The zero point is the final session where infants were only crawling. And then one month is one, with one month walking experience and so on. So these are the data from the low risk and the high risk no diagnosis group. And they replicate the Wally phenomenon perfectly. 
So what you see here, um, and the analysis that we used here was a piecewise HLM model. So what that does is, is it allows you to compare the slope of the entire curve, so across the full observation period, to the slope following the onset of walking, and to determine whether there's additional growth above and beyond the baseline rate of growth over the full seven-month period. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so there is significant additional growth following walk onset. So um, on average, across the seven month period, I think the low risk infants were um, acquiring about eight to 10 new words in their receptive vocabularies every month. After walk onset, they um, acquired an additional, I believe, seven words, right? So there's a lot of additional growth that happens once they begin to walk. So the language delay infants show a similar pattern, but it so there is marginally significant additional growth following the onset of walking for them. But for the infants with ASD, that slope post-walk onset is not significantly different from the slope across the, um, the full observation period. So this finding is actually what sparked our interest in walking and trying to understand what it is that walking buys infants and how infants with autism are using walking and the opportunities that are provided by being able to walk um, in order to kind of advance development. Okay, so um, the, the take home point here I think is that early motor abilities like walking create opportunities for exploration and for social interaction um, that might be important for the development of language. And when there are differences in these abilities, particularly in infants for whom we know there are vulnerabilities in executive development, um, those resulting experiences or reduce reduction in experiences might actually be related to delays in language development. So obviously language is a, a, you know, a, a very complex system that draws on multiple abilities. And it's not that walking is driving language development. But experiences that are afforded by walking might actually benefit infants in important ways. And for infants who are already vulnerable to language delays, the lack of experience, right, so differences in how walking is deployed um, might have an impact on opportunities for learning. Okay, um, second story has to do with the language learning environment. Shift gears a little bit and talk about fine motor skills, um, and in particular as they relate to how infants manipulate objects and impact labeling by their caregivers. So. Um, there are a number of studies that have demonstrated high-risk infants, um, regardless of diagnostic outcome at age three, exhibit early appearing weaknesses in fine motor abilities. So these are data from um, our recent Baby Siblings Consortium study in which we did an item level analysis of the Mullen um, fine motor subscale. And what you see here are the performance curves. So you see the percent of infants that are failing the individual items on, um, on this subscale. So the black line is the low risk infants, the orange dash line, the high risk ASD infants, and then we had two additional groups of high risk infants. High risk infants who had a low ADOS score at 36 months, and high risk infants who had an elevated ADOS score at 36 months but did not meet criteria or clinical judgment for um, an autism diagnosis. So the bottom line, to, um, I think take home point here from this figure is that what you see is that all of the high risk groups begin to fail items earlier compared to the low risk groups. So the failure rates are much higher at the earlier items for the high risk groups compared to the low risk groups. And so that results in the, in the curve being kind of offset to the left. So, and they, these are data, by the way, from 625 infants. This is like the biggest sample I think I'll ever have in my entire career. Um, so this is a pretty, you know, this is a very substantial sample. Um, we have also found in some of our previous work, fine motor skills in the second year are good predictors of expressive language at age, even after controlling for um, nonverbal developmental skills. And so the question then is why? Why is there this relationship between fine motor abilities and language later on? So there are a variety of 
possibilities, right? But the one candidate that we were interested in was that perhaps what infants do with objects and how they manipulate objects impacts the language learning environment, right? So when babies are holding toys and doing things with them, that would actually shape the input that characters are providing. And indeed, there's some experimental evidence for this. So. Um, Chen, uh, Chen Yu and Linda Smith have done a series of uh, lovely experimental studies in the laboratory in which they've demonstrated that um, infants are more likely to learn words for objects that they're holding at the time the label is produced compared to other objects that are just in an array on the table. Right? And so by isolating, by grasping a toy, infants effectively isolate it from all of the other possible reference in the room. And that could be quite powerful for a caregiver. And that's because if we think about what word learning is really like in the wild, so we like to study it in the lab with just like a few different options, and you know, we try, like to try to keep it tight and clean. But this is the real world, <laughs> right? This is where babies are learning words, right? And so for a caregiver, look at all this stuff here, right? You're trying to figure out what your child is interested in, but then your child picks up a toy. That's a powerful cue that they're interested in that, and so language just flows about that toy um, in the successive moments. Um, but in order for that strategy to be effective, for caregivers to kind of link input to um, objects that are being grasped, caregivers have to coordinate labeling with infants' object manipulation. Um, so they have to do something like this. So here we have a baby who's really interested in this ball, about to eat it, and the caregiver says, you've got the ball, right? So we think about that as kind at the right time, right? The baby's honed in on the toy, the parent provides the word ball, it's this magic moment for word learning. So we were interested in seeing whether we could find evidence for this phenomenon in naturalistic settings. Um, and so these, uh, this data set was actually, so I don't even want to think about how old these children are now, I think they're actually college students. These are data that I collected myself when I was a postdoc. Um, and so it was a longitudinal study of just regular old infants from the general population. Um, we saw them monthly from I think about 10 until uh, 30 months. And so we selected the sessions when infants were 10, 12, and 14 months old. Um, and they were videotaped at home for 15 minutes playing with a standard toy set. We gave them this bag of toys um, and just asked them to play as they, nor as they normally would. And so from the videos, we extracted several pieces of information. So first, we looked at infant object manipulation. So in, in all of the instances where infants were asking a toy, but then identifying what they were doing with the toy. So were they engaged in sensory motor behaviors like banging and shaking? Um, were they engaged in functional actions, so like stirring the spoon in the little bowl? Um, or were they simply holding the toy? We transcribed all maternal utterances and identified all instances of labeling. And then we compiled, we kind of pulled these two streams of data together and identified all instances where maternal labeling co-occurred with infant object manipulation. And so I'm going to show you a bit of those data now. So just by way of the preliminaries, um, for months, we didn't observe any significant change in how much mothers talked. Um, or in the proportion of their utterances that contained labels. But the babies changed a lot, not surprisingly. So there was a significant increase in the proportions of time that infants spent manipulating objects and in the proportion of time that they spent engaging in more complex manipulation, like functional actions, for example. So this is not terribly surprising. So, however, what was interesting was that when infants manipulated objects, compared to when they were not manipulating objects, mothers talked less. So this was initially kind of a surprise to us, because we figured mothers would talk a lot when babies were holding toys. They would just you know, unleash it and produce wonderful input. But they actually didn't. What was different, though, was that those utterances were richer in labeling content. Okay, and then looking at um, caregiver labeling. So what you see here are, is um, on the y-axis the proportion of total caregiver labels that were produced um, at 
10, 12, and 14 months um, under four different conditions. So um, when the infant was in red, both holding and looking at the toy, in blue when the infant was only holding the toy but not looking at it, in black when the infant was only looking at the toy, and then in green, neither. So there was a toy somewhere but the infant wasn't actually doing anything. And so what you see is that here that mothers are most likely to provide labels when their and toy increase significantly over time. And then the other piece story is that how infants manipulated objects mattered quite a bit. And so here what you see are um, the, the dependent measure is the proportion of caregiver labels that corresponded to infants holding and looking um, that uh, involved functional action in red, sensory motor action in blue, and just passive holding in black. And so this was a bit of a surprise as we thought that caregivers would be most likely to label when infants were producing functional actions because those are kind of the most sophisticated types of actions. But it turned out that what really mattered was that infants were doing something with the object. So they were shaking or banging or stirring or drinking. Um, so active manipulation compared to just passive holding turned out to be kind of where, where the action was. Um, it's possible that had we gotten, gone farther out in development, we would have started to see more of a kind of difference in favor of, um, of, functional of functional actions. OK, so we know from a variety that infants, high-risk infants engage in less skilled and less frequent object manipulation. So for the future is how might this the language input they receive? And we have some hints from some other work that there are differences in how frequently caregivers label with high risk compared to low risk infants. So this is, um, this is a figure from a small study that looked at maternal input to high risk toddlers without an ASD diagnosis. Toddler. And we found um, that high risk mothers um, produce significantly, or produce labels at a significantly lower rate than did, than did mothers of low risk toddlers. And then these are brand, brand new data from um, a Bachelor of Philosophy thesis um, that was just completed this past spring, where this student, Elizabeth Kushner, looked at labeling in um, a, an engagement state called coordinated joint engagement, so where parents and infants are actively looking at the same toy at the same time, and the infant is checking back and forth between the toy and the caregiver's face. And what she found was that um, there were differences between l mothers of low-risk toddlers and mothers of all high-risk toddlers. The rate of different, um, different labels provided, so that's on the left-hand side, and then in just the overall rate of labeling as well. So to wrap things up, a um, couple of conclusions to date. So infants who have familial risk for ASD, both who do and who don't, receive an ASD diagnosis very substantially in early development. Some of these babies are indistinguishable from low-risk infants. Others have delays. Um, but it seems that the most significant delays are apparent in infants who later are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. The second take-home point is that all of this variability in early motor development does seem to be meaningful downstream. So it does seem to have far-reaching and cascading effects on the emergence of behavior in other domains. So remember the story of walking experience and vocabulary development. And also on the learning environment. So remember here the story of object manipulation and caregiver labeling. So I want to leave you with um, an even kind of bigger picture point, which is that we like to think about um, development and kind of early development predicting later development in a very child-centered way, right? So this is something that the field has done for a very long time. So the child who is delayed, for example, in the ability to initiate joint attention becomes the child who has a language delay, right? And this is kind of how we've traditionally thought of this.
But I would actually propose that there's a lot more to it, right? So there is this child piece, but the child impacts the environment, right? The child responds to the environment, and the environment responds to the child. So when you have a child who is delayed in kind of the, I guess, the component behaviors of joint attention, that has an impact on, how, on what the environment does in response. So if you're interacting with a child who has difficulty initiating joint attention, you have to work really hard to keep an interaction going, right? You have to like pull things out of the sky. And after a while, it gets really, really challenging. And so if you are the parent or caregiver of a child who's delayed, it really limits topics for communication, right? You have less to talk about. That means that you're then providing less linguistic input that's tailored to what's going on in the moment. Um, and it also means that your impressions of the child's developmental level are going to be different, right, from, for example, those of a caregiver who has a child who's kind of on track relative to their age. And so all these things also have a future language the child plays that impact future development. It's also this big environmental response to the child that are just as important, that's just as important. So I have to thank lots of people. So first of all, the, the people, the funding agencies that have supported this work, Nancy Minshew, Diane Williams, and Holly Gaskeb, who have been really instrumental in making this program of research move forward and providing clinical support. Um, and then the wonderful team of people that I work with at the University of Pittsburgh. This is just a tiny fraction of them. Um, and of course, the families who not only shared their children with us for three years, but also opened their homes to large numbers of people carrying very strange equipment. <laughs> um, so them, and thank you to you. <laughs> That's really highly related to the gross motor because if you once you sit up, your hands are more free, and then yep. once you walk, your hands are even more free. Right. So, like, how do you tease out the effect of the gross motor versus the fine right. motor? Um, so I know that's I don't expect you to like have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> Just curious. Yeah. What yeah. Is. I, I mean, that's a great question. And I think that, in many ways, is the hardest question of all, because everything is connected and everything matters. And you know, even these very small changes in other systems, I mean, like you said, with sitting up, right? Sitting up is sitting up. But wow, my hands are free, right? And I can manipulate toys, and, and I'm upright, and I can look at people. And so you know, there's this whole set of things that comes along you know, really for free when, when, that, when that happens. So I think you know, one. So I, I guess what I would say, have a mechanism or set of mechanisms identified at this point in time. Um, my personal belief is that with infants who, are, who go on to an autism diagnosis, that we're probably talking about some very broad and very general mechanisms that then impact a host of other skills, right? Um, but that's, you know, that's kind of more my personal opinion than anything I have substantial evidence for. One thing I do think um, is important to keep in mind is that you know, there are babies who have very significant motor deficits who learn to talk just fine, right? So none of these none of these skills are necessary right or sufficient for development to happen but they're they're normally participatory right so all other things being equal if you are an infant who is 
um, not, does not have a significant motor problem, right? These factors are going to come into play at some point in time. So they're normally participatory, but they're not, they're not required. And so it may be that for some infants who have these, you know, kind of early appearing vulnerabilities in, um, in motor skills and in communicative skills, you know, they somehow find an alternative pathway, right, to that endpoint. But for other babies, you know, kind of switching pathways, however that comes about, is much more problematic. And they're more likely to kind of get stuck. And so that's where then you start to see the delays kind of add up, I guess, over time. So I'm not sure that that really answers your question. It, gives me, it gave me an opportunity to put a disclaimer <laughs> out there, which I think is a really, really important one, especially for people who are interested in thinking about, you know, kind of atypical development and alternative developmental trajectories. Um, but I do think, you know, it's, it's, it's a complicated problem. And trying to pull things apart in a way that allows you to identify like one thing, is, it's a real challenge. Because infants don't develop these skills in isolation. Yeah, OK, go ahead. Um, I appreciate everything you said. It's Thanks. Really interesting. Especially when it last, because so often in autism research, we put on these blinders. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's nice to have experience working with other disabilities that we can say, oh, yeah, this kid with CP who had significant motor delays, we saw this happening. Yep. Um, I wonder, you, you mentioned a lot of the things that um, parents didn't do as much. Yes. Because the child was not developing um, the walking and the standing as quickly. Were there other, um, and maybe not even data, but anecdotally mm -hmm. as well, that you observed other um, parent behaviors that actually maybe increased? To oh, that's to a good question. Things? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that. Um, our, and here I say this as you know, kind of a representative of the field of baby siblings research. I think our understanding of parenting behavior is well behind our understanding of infant behavior. And I think maybe partly that's because of the old kind of refrigerator mother's perspective and maybe some hesitance on the part of researchers to start to look at parenting behavior um, because it's a, it's a delicate enterprise. But I mean, I do think thing I can say is that there is tremendous variability across parents in what they do, right? So there are some parents who are quite didactic with their child. And there are other parents who are very kind of, you know, laid back and, oh, yeah, you know, it's good, it's all good. And they don't really do anything unique or special, I would say. Um, I do think there is enough evidence now for us to say that there is some spillover um, so if you have an older child with autism, some of the, the things that you do in those interactions do carry over to what you do with your younger child. And in some cases, that might be really helpful. And in some cases, it might not be. And so I just think that we don't have the data really to yet to, to do that. But I like that spin on it. I like the, are there other things that they seem to be doing that might be, that might be positively related? Like you know, physical Right, context. exactly. A little bit of yeah, yeah, exactly. So things like that. Yeah, I, I think I think we just badly need more work. Yeah, I was uh, going in a similar direction. Just said with the fact that we, we do not know the extent to which uh, parental responses may play a role in steering. Not right. Problem. We always have to. You know, there is this hesitance of really focusing on the parents or the concern or going back. To right. It's your fault. But um, I think that, that we should really try and, and push the alternative view that it, while it is not the parents' fault, that the parents still may yes. play a much uh, a stronger role in the early, early phases in right. steering those developmental trajectory yep. you know, m toward a more uh, optimal outcome if they are aware of the fact, which is, which is hard, as you said, when, when a baby reaches out to you, mm -hmm. of course you're going to drop everything doing, you know, yeah. to attend to that. If the, the baby on their hand is not and is happily there on the floor playing with the toys, you may just be answering an email or, or right. checking the mail or whatever it is. Right. If you, you know, it's, it's, so it may impact. And we're human, but that's yep. what we do, right? We right. respond to bid for interaction. And yep. things are less. I mean, yep. we are going to likely engage less in yep. response. So it's not to blame the parents, but I think awareness of how certain types yep. of behavior, how yep. one can work yep. around and take a more perhaps active role in absence of a yeah. initiation on the parent on the side yeah. of the baby. Yep. 
ensuring that early on may show some delay in some of these functions, you know, then yep. take off versus remaining caught in this loop yep. where now, well, they initiate less, the parents respond more, there are fewer opportunities in that kind of cascade. Yeah, 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 exactly. No, I, th I think that's exactly right. It is. And we have struggle, I think. Yes. I think we're, the, yes. The focus on the parents, and, and I think we can do yeah. better in, in making them, empower them, particularly yeah. in the population where they have already had a child with autism, so they're already very concerned right. about right. You know, the outcome. Right. No, I think I think that's that's exactly, and I think you know, parents like I can think of a handful from for whom the infant is their second child, and so their their parenting experience has been parenting a child who is developing atypically. They are not familiar with normative development, and so you know a lot of times we get questions like you know is this what baby should be doing at this stage or you know is it okay that he's doing this and um but i think that's right i think this whole especially for babies who you know have difficulty like getting things going and like engaging with the world empowering parents to say you know here's some things that you could do right when when that doesn't happen like you could try you could try this because i do think i mean you know we have some evidence that um so, you know, parents, when babies point or show, right, parents often respond by labeling the thing that is being pointed to. Um, and mothers of high-risk infants to do that just like mothers of low-risk infants, but their problem is they have fewer opportunities because their babies produce those gestures much less often. And so then the issue becomes, okay, well, you know, what else could they be responding to? Like their babies are doing other things. Like could we teach them to provide those labeling responses just to like vocalizations or to other kinds of gestures that maybe are less developmentally advanced but just as communicative in many ways. I think this is a really fantastic question and you know I'm hoping that maybe one day I'll get to tackle part of it but it is really really important and we are very behind in addressing it. Yeah. I have lots of questions. But okay. <laughs> I thought it was really fascinating that you saw in those infants um, when you were looking at walking yeah. that actually the overall amount of time spent walking was similar. Yeah. And so you were mentioning then the frequency in bouts might be right. perhaps a little bit differently. And I'd say in some of the work we have done here, we see that looking at walking onset, even when it's the same, their velocity is a little bit slower yeah. or their, you know, their yeah. stride width is a little bit longer, yeah. making them a little bit slower. Yeah. So as you're starting to look at that, I'm curious yeah. to know, you know, I think one perhaps could it point to maybe those with genetic etiologies versus not. Uh -huh. um, could it be a proxy of maybe lower tone that mm -hmm. we sometimes see in these mm -hmm. individuals? So I'm curious to know some mm -hmm. of the things that you guys are seeing and maybe starting to differentiate right. within that. Right. So it sounds like you're using a gate is that right? <laughs> yes. We're also using a carpet. We're just learning. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, so part of Part of what, I, what I'm interested in is looking at kind of the consolidation of walking. Like, how long does it take you to kind of reach that more kind of um, skilled toddler gait, right? Where your feet are not like, you know, 12 feet not taking little teeny steps like Frankenstein and your um, step length and step width intervals are more uniform. Thinking about that as, as like, well, if that's harder for you, then doing other things while you're walking is going to be very challenging, right? Like carrying a toy to someone else or maintaining, like, I don't know, a social goal in mind or whatever. So um, yeah, so I think actually I have no idea what we're going to find with, um, with the footfall data. I do think that, yes, I think there, it will be interesting to see if maybe there is a subgroup of infants that kind of falls out of all of this where the footfall data tell us, you know, there's something, there's a significant motor challenge here that we might not observe kind of with the naked eye because this is a baby who's walking, right? But deep down, if we look at these metrics, walking is hard, right? And so that suggests perhaps the need for some other intervention, but it also means that maybe how walking is utilized then is going to be quite different, right? And how, what kinds of experiences that baby gets from, um, from walking is also going to be different. I don't know if that answers your question, really. Really, but um, but yeah, that, those are my those are my thoughts for what they're worth. Yeah. Okay, I'll ask one more. Okay, so go for it. You know, I think this is kind of adding to even what Shula was getting at as well. So not you know, I don't. I wish we all had the answer of what is the causal sort of mechanism. Yeah. But I think I often get with this line of work, in particular as a neurologist, that. You know, these kids who have motor impairments, it's just because they're overall more impacted, right? It's an early brain. 
<laughs> and that's why you're just showing it. Yeah. But some of the things that you sort of alluded to is there is a tremendous amount of heterogeneity. And yeah. it, it is likely, yeah. right? There's aberrant early brain mechanisms leading to overall cognitive delays with those things. Right. But it's these motor impairments that might be impacting those. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious to know, and of course looking at your work as you've just language delay, have you started parsing out more of those who might, in that heterogeneous, mm -hmm. you know, genius sort of population, mm -hmm. um, more things like just overall cognitive delays and right. looking at motor skills or overall right. other sort of aspects of developmental areas with those with language delays and... Yeah, know. I mean, I, I, I share, I mean, so my observation motor delays at least especially in the first year are everywhere mm -hmm. right and so if you were to look back at who is delayed at six months relative to like where they are at two or three it would be impossible to predict right it's not the kids who at three have language concerns necessarily right it's not the kids who at three seem to have perhaps lower um, nonverbal um, what do you call it on the mall? And I forget what it is, the visual reception, lower visual reception scores. Um, there really doesn't seem to be any rhyme nor reason to it. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, so it's really challenging. And so there was a, there was a meta analysis, I, I think back in 2010, um, showing that motor impairments were present, you know, kind of across the lifespan, regardless of level of functioning. I mean, they were just everywhere. And um, one of my students did a meta analysis recently where she looked at the high risk infant literature, and it was exactly the same, exactly the same thing. So, I mean, it, it may be, it's interesting to think about, you know, it, it seems to be an early vulnerability for many high risk infants, not all, but many of them. Them. And so then, like, what it means and why some babies recover and why some don't, I think is a really, I mean, that's really the key question. Like, what is it that predicts, you know, kind of recovery? Just like, what is it that predicts recovery from early language delay, right? Because we know that that happens, too. Um, and, and we haven't actually started to, to look at that, but I think that that would be a great question. Yeah. So Jeff, now I can't remember what you did. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Created those late, if you use latent classes instead of diagnosis, yeah, those trajectories. Do you think oh, that's ASD, a good idea. Would the ASD kids fall out as a clean group, or would they be mixed in with a language delay kids? Uh, that's a really good question. I, I don't know, but that's a really, really good idea. We should do that. Yeah. I'm just thinking again. I really liked what you said about um, kind of the compensation or flexibility that some babies might have. Like mm -hmm. late in one area, some babies child was like a super slow walker mm -hmm. he was 18 months mm -hmm. old, but he's typically developing and he he was really really early talker mm -hmm. and verbal so just that's an example mm -hmm. he, yes mm -hmm. he didn't he wasn't able to benefit from that sort of like right being like towards you with the thing but somehow he still managed to compensate um and like learn to right so i'm wondering like i just that idea seems really compelling to me and i could imagine that like if you had low cognitive abilities, that would impact your ability yeah. to compensate. But there are other things that could impact, like just having autism and having a more kind of rigid or less flexible mm -hmm. brain um, mm -hmm. in some way mm -hmm. could also affect your ability to compensate. So it could be that like there are these yeah. things that if you're completely typically developing, your brain's going to find a way around it. Doesn't matter. Yeah. And in the same way, those sort of like subtle environmental differences might not, might not matter as much. Right. Might not matter if you're encouraging you to walk or, you know, label something two times instead of three times. Right, um, right. But if you're not totally typically developing, whether it's lower cognitive skills or autism or whatever it is, like, yeah. you know. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah, I think this, this resilience question is not something that we have really as you know kind of a group of researchers really talked about all that much, but I do think it's fascinating and you would that we have this baby siblings consortium gigantic number of infants it's a question that someone could and should ask because I think you know we've now like spent all of our time saying they're not doing this they're not doing this they're not doing this and it maybe it's time to shift gears and say okay you know how can we think about like who's getting to you know an age appropriate endpoint at three and then for ones who aren't like what might what can we learn from that to kind of to kind of support the development of those who might be kind of slower or struggling along the way? Yeah.
Looking even at the combination, it was really interesting with the object exploration mm -hmm. and your high risk infant's language delay. Actually, had a good amount of object exploration. Yeah. If I was reading that correctly. Yeah. But perhaps, actually, what you were sort of saying, it's the quality of object exploration that was kind of differentiating out the high risk. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's a combination of that plus the walking plus the environmental cues. Yeah. Well, but yeah. 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 I'm just. Uh, Right? I mean, I don't know if you have the data or you will have the data to look at that, but um, it can be used, as you've shown mm -hmm. through this video, you know, for, a, for a child to initiate yeah. interaction. It could also be used for a child to yes. escape. Escape, <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. And, yes. And that's really just something yes. I think I was having with Sally Rogers ages ago, where, I was, uh, where she was like talking and saying, like, you know, oh, my thought I, you know, with all of my ex clinical experience, I thought I, uh, I, I would have been able to tell. You know, I've been working with some of these mm -hmm. babies, you know, and at six months it was like perfect face-to-face -face mm -hmm. interaction. You hold mm -hmm. them, they're they're mm -hmm. smiling, they're cooing, and mm -hmm. back. It is good. Mm -hmm. And then they come in at 12 months, and now this child is uh, walking, mm -hmm. and uh, in. And is just like, you know, going all over the yep. room, playing with the yep. toys and like not responding to me whatsoever. Yep. And so there is something to be, yeah. to be said that we yeah. like uh, looking at the different views that uh, even babies who yeah. later get a diagnosis may make of that new skill. Yes. Uh, because they, in a way, if particularly, yeah. as I said, it could, it could work. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, and I mean, I think that, that's a great point. And so actually, I didn't put the, the, the figure here, but we did look at that. So we looked at social approaches. And so again, remember, the, like, the farthest time point is three months of walking experience. So there were no differences in social approaches, right? So the number of times that babies approached um, a caregiver or another social partner um, between any of the groups. But what we don't know is like what the quality of that was. So was it just like, a, you know, oh, checking in, heading out now, see you later, or, or versus, a, hey, I'm bringing you this toy. I want, you know, I want to show you this toy. I want you to talk about this toy, right? Because that would obviously gen lead to very different consequences. My impression has been just from being, you know, with some of these 18 month olds. There's a lot of wandering that goes on, and so I also think too that the developmental window that we looked at was a little like a little too short, and that if we looked at 18 and 24 months, we would see much more. Like I have this vivid memory of this one um, uh, girl in our sample who wandered around her house at the 18-month visit singing the Barney song, and that was all she did was wander and sing Barney. Yeah, exactly. It's a very difficult video to watch. But, I mean, that's a great example of what you're talking about is, yeah, yeah, she's using walking, but there doesn't, like, it's not clear what it's Bring up also relates to fields such as early childhood special ed and early intervention. Mm -hmm. um, these are the types of things that, while not well validated, we've had assessments for for decades and yeah. kind of been attuned to like mapping out child's interactions at as early as 16, 18 yep. months and you know looking at how they're engaging or disengaging. Um, I'm interested, um, you, you, you just kind of touched upon the idea of the quality versus the quantity. Um, thinking about how early infants who are at risk oftentimes have issues with attention disengagement, mm -hmm. did you guys observe that? That they were stuck. So we have not really. So one of the goals of doing video recordings in homes is that there are many sacrifices that you have to make, right? And so one of the big sacrifices is you often don't get a good enough view of the child's face to do coding of eye gaze. And so the best we can do when we do that, and we have not done it very much, is to say whether the child is looking at something or not, right? Um, and so I think, so we haven't gone there just because I have felt pretty strongly that the quality of our data just won't allow that. Um, I mean, you know, other people have talked about that, and I do think that especially for kids with autism, the you know, difficulties with attentional shifting, and in some cases, attention maintenance, I mean, those are very basic things that impact a whole set of different kinds of behaviors and, um, and skills. And so I think it's, you know, it's one of those things that should not be underestimated as a really significant concern. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. I think we'll oh. Oh, one more question. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, was, I was curious if you had any information variability in the older siblings. Yeah, right. Siblings. 
Yeah. yeah. So we have not actually looked at that specifically in relation to younger sibling characteristics, which is, I think, kind of what you're getting at. I can tell you that our, the older siblings span the full range of absolutely everything, right? Um, so some are you know, not testable on a cognitive assessment and are minimally verbal or non-speaking. Um, others are, you know, very verbal, um, but, you know, have social challenges. And so, I mean, you know, any, any kind of example of how autism manifests, we definitely have it among the older siblings. They also vary a lot in, in age um, and in kind of birth position relative to the baby, too. But you are not the first person to ask me this question, and it reminds me that I need to put it on my to-do list. <laughs> down the road because I do think it's I mean it's a really interesting question and it gets kind of at this environment thing too because if you have an older sibling who's non-speaking right that's quite different than having an older sibling who's highly verbal right and parent behaviors might might manifest quite differently okay thank you, thank you.